Welcome to The Change Show with Simon Phillips. It's great to have you here. Do send me your messages on social media and let me know what aspects of change you'd like some help with. Um, I've got with us today a worldwide expert. I can't think of any better word on the whole subject of resilience, and I'm going to introduce her right now. Vanda North, how are you? Well, I'm extremely well. I am very happy to say, dear Simon, and how are you? Well, do you know what? I couldn't be any better. (laughs) I love it. I love it. And I hope everyone listening is also so, or at least wanting to improve, because hopefully we can share some things with them. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, do you know what? For, For the people listening at home or in the car or out walking maybe with the dogs, who knows where you are, Um, I think you're going to find some really practical advice in today's show, which will really help you whatever's going on for you right now in your life. So let me introduce you uh, semi-formally, Vanda, because I know you don't like things to be too formal. So, So Vanda North has been teaching people about stress management since 1972. And what's amazing is, which I know Vanda will probably share with us, is it's still all relevant. Next year, that'll be 50 years, and it's still relevant, which is a bit upsetting on one level, isn't it? (laughs) Not that you're still relevant, but that the topic is still relevant. (laughs) But I wanted to just highlight before we get into the topic of, of resilience is that Vanda also helped get mind mapping into the arms and the hearts of everybody around the world as the uh, as the business model leader, if you like, for mind mapping. And you started and ran the Busan centers worldwide for many years. And then you even went on, I believe, to found as one of the co-founders, if you like, of the World Memory Championships. So, you know, not a bad CV, I suppose. It was a fascinating journey, and it was all a part of my real purpose, which is to help people be the best they can be, which is, in fact, actually to help them be joyous. And I thought everybody was initially, but then I discovered, no, they weren't. So then the quest, exactly like you said, Simon, was to find really practical, simple, everyday doable things that people could put into their lives and would just make them begin to see, well, maybe I can, maybe it is possible, maybe things could work for me. And and that was my whole goal. And I love that you've got a a life purpose, haven't you? Come on, share that. Well, it is just to help people enhance their joy, that that is it. And it sounds rather airy fairy, but I put very strong roots underneath it by trying to do a lot of research, practice on myself to make sure it works and constantly share every single day. That is my focus. And I look for every single way. My signature, for example, which is V, um, I make into a, a kind of around and put a little smiley face. And in the days when more you did your signature, it often would just change a sour looking face to kind of what's that? And then looking up at me and then they'd start to smile and I go, yes, I've done it again. Just that little change. I love that because the thing about joy is, as you say, it can initially be perceived as a bit airy fairy, but then what you do is you take it really seriously take the job of spreading joy really seriously and I think you know if there's anybody out there listening that just wants to take that on that mantle and you know maybe take the bat on and go and run with that you are very welcome to go and spread the joy wherever you're living absolutely <laughs> highly encouraged in fact that is the thing about having a purpose and I'm sure in some of your other sessions either in the past or the future you you would look at the power of purpose to help pull people through whatever they might actually be having to go through. I call it my second heartbeat. It is very, very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. No, it'll definitely be a big feature in, in a future episode, I'm sure. So come on, then. You t- I've given you a, a semi-formal uh, introduction. Maybe you, you could share with us a little bit about this stress management resilience journey you've been on and, and tell us you know, how you've ended up where you are maybe today yes. for this happily do so. Back in 1972, when I was an administrator in a school system in Palm Beach County, I was doing training for the teachers and the staff. And stress came up 
as really the first time it had been discussed and, and thought of as something that you could actually say. Mm. And so I then researched to find out what could I do to help them. And there was a questionnaire that more or less said, if you're alive, probably what you're experiencing is going to cause you stress. And oh, by the way, if you're stressed, it's quite likely that you're going to get sick. As they would say over there, have a nice day. And so I thought, ah, this is not good. But what I also discovered was that some people under those high stress situations would thrive, would certainly manage if not thrive. And I thought, fascinating. Mm. Who are they? Where are they? What do they do? How do they do it? And so my life then became an ongoing research, meeting people, discussing, learning more about the brain, working with myself and with other people to what actually makes a difference. How can we actually help people manage stress and strain? And I have to say, even though, as you <clears throat> rather nicely pointed out, that was nearly 50 years ago, um, that I am still in touch with quite a few of the people that I shared some of those way back then things to do. And they are, will often say, oh, I just did your mm -mm -mm, whatever it was. And it still works. And it's just like, yes, thank you. That is just so good. Wow, fantastic. So where has all this work taken you? Well, a marvelous journey. Um, way back then, I did a whole series of television shows called Happiness and Wellness. I ran um, ongoing programs for happiness and wellness, well-being, wellness, resilience, weren't words that were really known at that time. Mm. And so even when I was uh, managing, founding the Buzan Centers, I was still constantly looking at how I could share things with people that would work. And that is, you know, it just grew over the years. We kept refining. I got some colleagues that were in the area and we'd bounce backwards and forwards ideas. Any of the latest books or the research, I was fortunate that I could travel and just sucked it all in and said, okay, this is theory. What does it mean on a practical everyday basis? And one thing led to another, you know, how life just one thing happens and then another thing and then another thing and it just all rolls on and you come out thinking mm, that was quite exciting and so i know exactly what you mean by that and that's, and that's <laughs> so, so this is the change show you know we're here to try and help people who are out there trying to make change happen whether that's just in their own lives or supporting others and i'm guessing you've probably worked with a lot of change makers because when you're in that environment, the stress increases. So, you know, do you have any particular memories of working in that space? Well, I was working a lot, actually, in the financial district. And I was doing different workshops. And every year I would do a global going around and training people with, you know, whatever it was that was that year. And so the same people would come back and see me, you know, every couple of years, I'd get to see them again, which was terrific. And one year back in the early 2000s, I looked at them and I said, uh, what's happening? What's going on? And they said, we're so stressed. We're so stressed. Now, these were leading people that were dealing with changes in the market, changes going on in the world. Everything impacts finances. I hadn't really realized. And they were just going crazy. And I said, oh, and they said, so I said, well, what are you doing? And some of them were getting into drugs. Some of them were um, becoming rather feeling uh, unwell. They were showing manifestations of stress. Some were into drink. Some were depressed. And I said, well, do you know, you know, some stress things? As you say, basic things have been out there for a long time now. Mm. And they'd say, oh, yes, 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 we know. But the single bleat from around the world was, but we don't have the time. So I said, right, okay. So I came back from that, sat down with a very good colleague of mine, Richard Israel, a fellow resilience builder stress. I said, Richard, it's up to you and me to take the best of everything that, that we know, the best of everything we've ever shared, scrunch it down so it can be a time that everybody would look at me in the eye and say, hmm, there's no way I can't not do that in a day. So we started with 12 minutes, nah. 10 minutes, boring, eight, eight, eight is a lovely number. It's nice and round. You can cut it into two threes, two fours, two zeros. I love the number, <laughs> eight. So we thought, right, can we do this? And then we began 
testing it, trying it out on people. I was very fortunate to have Wiley Capstone decide they wanted to publish the book. So it became a book, a bright green book, which I think I see behind you. Yeah. And um, yeah. I then went back around the world, taking to the people that had inspired the idea in the first place, um, how to manage their stress and build their resilience overall for things in work, because change is in work life, home life, professional life, your community life. It's in every single part of your life. Change is always there. So learning to not have it as a battle, but learning more to have it as a as a friend, in fact, that actually can open doors that wouldn't have opened before, learning to have it as a source of energy, as a source of, ooh, how can we do something different, was something that I really wanted to be able to share to these people and was very fortunate to be able to do so. Yeah, well, I know, I know we're going to, well, you may not know, but I know I'm going to ask you to sort of go into a bit more detail of what's in there um, after the break. But before then, is this how you do it once and it, you're sorted for life or is it a, a daily practice or how do you encourage people to get involved in thinking about looking after themselves? Usually people change for two reasons. There's a negative push or a positive pull. Mm. And unfortunately, it's quite frequently the negative push that has to get really, really bad before they decide that they're going to change. And then, of course, it's a lot harder work to be able to make the change. Yeah. Having a positive pull is so much more of a creative, energetic, nice way to go. So consequently, it is every day, you said, is it a once? No, it is an everyday commitment to eight minutes. The time it takes to make a cup of tea. I mean, it, it, it's not a big lock yourself in the toilet for eight minutes. Nobody will miss you. You can do that. It is a slowly, slowly building. So, I mean, one of the ways people can do it is just take one of the steps each day and build one step and then one, two steps, one, two, three steps, one, two, four steps away. Since it only takes eight minutes um, and people can maybe follow a link to a 15 minute video I did where they can see all I just explain all eight steps clearly, then, you know, what it is, is you can leap in if you want. And just time yourself for those eight minutes and do it. Now, what happens is the more you do it, the more you program your brain to constantly work for you during the entire remaining 23 hours and however many minutes that is, to be helping you to build your resilience. Small steps. So for people that are starting, small steps, small steps. Have a buddy. Have someone else, if you can, to start at the same time and check with each other. Have you done it today? Have you done it today? And if you fall off the wagon and don't do it, don't throw the baby in the bathwater out. Just say, oops, meant to do it, new habit, haven't got a groove for it yet. I'll do it today. And that's the way you begin to shift habits and make change happen internally. Definitely. And I know there's a lot of talk around leadership development circles at the moment about habits and you know in recent years we've had a, a few books talking about just that point of you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater if you miss a day get back onto it the next day because it's no big deal I think sometimes we worry that oh I've missed a day what does that mean well it means nothing so stop and get back on with what you're doing I love that the author of the book that she's been telling you about it's called Mind Chi and now I'm going to let Vanda tell us a little bit more about that book, which I know has been a bestseller all over the world. I can't remember. Was it eight languages it's been translated into? So if you haven't heard about it, it's because it came out before this plethora of books that are out here now about well-being and, and mindfulness and all the rest of it. But this is the book which I think has broken the mould in this space and is really practical and helping people. So if you haven't heard about it, Go and grab your copy, Mind Chi. So yeah, that's my little promo for the book, Vanda, but you tell me, tell me a little bit more about it. <laughs> well, when we wrote the book, um, we decided to bake it into four sections. And the first section, being married to a medical research scientist, 
um, I wanted to make sure that for people for whom knowing that the authority, the foundation was really there, they would have all of that information. And so we put in there the fact that it uses um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, that it uses the latest information about uh, the fact that we have a plasticity to our brain, that we can always change, that we can always learn something new. Yeah. It even looks at the habits that a researcher did for OCD and really said, OK, let's look at how we can pull some of those into helping people with much less serious diseases, or not diseases, but much less serious desires to be able to manage to do so and make the changes that they wanted. So we pulled a lot of stuff together and put it in that fourth part. But I said, ooh, people that are picking up this book are probably going to be in need. They're going to want something practical. Mm -hmm. So I want the what is it right at the front. And we say to people, skim through the whole book, Start where you want. If the foundation is important first, then start there. But if you're hurting, if that negative push has got too bad, begin at the beginning. And at the beginning, we say, here are the eight steps. Here is one, two, three, four, five. We explain each of them. It's quite straightforward. Off you go. Well, I'm going to be we cheeky now. Yeah. I'm, think I'm thinking, do you know what? It'd be great to get you back again. <laughs> so why don't you uh, if if it's okay with you why don't you go into depth what do you think is of those eight steps which one do you think for the listener at home they could literally get with your explanation really quickly which one do okay. you, you think you want to share because if you ask me would you like this or that I usually say yes please um, <laughs> I'm going to say I have two actually and the first one that I want to do, and, and people will probably go, oh, why have I heard this so many times? But it's the power of a breath. And it is the first step. And it is that when we consciously think about our breathing, what we can do is cut right across the automatic response that says, oh, fight or flight, flood with adrenaline, be ready to run away, cortisol, let's get all of these nasty, nasty things going in the body. A breath can just begin to change that. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. We very carefully, because there's so many different styles of breathing for different outcomes, and we don't teach this. We don't teach this. By the way, if any of your listeners have children, please share this with children so they learn this early. That is so important. So we don't teach about the power of the difference of breathing unless you're an opera singer or an athlete you know, what a shame, because it makes all the difference. Yeah. If you do yoga or things like that, you're probably into it as well. So we selected what I call the square belly breath. And the square belly breath is if you think of a square, we say breathe in for about three seconds, hold your breath for about three seconds, breathe out for about three seconds, and then stay empty, wait for three seconds. And then breathe in for three seconds, etc. So it makes like a square shape, which makes it easier for me to remember. And the next time somebody cuts you up in traffic and you ah, have your just. And just doing that can mean that you've got oxygen coming into your brain. So that instead of reacting in a way that might be negative, you can choose how do I want to act? What do I want to do in this situation? Somebody closest to you pushes your button and waits for the response. Children are so good at this. And partners, they know exactly where your buttons are. Bing, just like that. And you're about to do your normal reaction and you go, and watch their faces. Oh, it is so much fun because they have lost their control over you. You have suddenly regained control. And this is what's so important is the whole premise is that you can have control over you. And that breath, particularly the square belly breath, is one of the key factors to begin to just say, okay, body, you are mine and I choose how you will respond.
So that's one of my absolute favorites. No, I, I love that because you're really focusing in on the power of choice. And I know that other elements of Mind Chi as well draw on that element of choice. And it, it's something that I talk to people about all the time when it comes to change, because sometimes in life, it feels like things are done to us, doesn't it? Yes. Maybe we lose our job or we get told by our government that we're going to be locked down or, yeah. um, you know, things happen in our families, which we don't feel we've got control over. And what we're reminding people about and what you're helping people about do in the moment is know they have a choice and yeah. know they can control their emotions, which in due course help them to manage their stress. Absolutely. I, mostly change happens to us from the outside. And so consequently, knowing that we have a, a selection of things that we can do to maintain our own status quo, even if things are really quite awful, if things are bad, we can always have a little corner inside of us, a little toehold where we can go, okay, eh, I've just got this little toehold that I can still hold on to. And therefore, from that position comes additional strength, comes ideas, comes the ability to be able to manage the change, which is constant and very often just thrust on us in a rather unseemly manner. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Thank you, Valentine. All right, go on then. I'll let you have a second one as well. Here comes my second one. Well, it actually has two bits to it. And so by the time we've done this, you will have actually got three of the eight steps of Mind Chi. And this one is called BEAT. It's an acronym for B for body, and you touch your thumb to your first finger, E for emotion, A for action, and T for thoughts. And this is actually the down and dirty of CBT. It's how to pull CBT into the now, right at this moment, because it's the only minute that you can change. So what do you do? B for body. First, you check what's going on in my body at the moment. And I liken it to a bit of an x-ray. Am I clenching my jaws? Is my neck stiff? Where are my shoulders? How is my body sitting and managing itself? And very quickly, what you can do is adjust. You can choose to change. So move your shoulders, adjust your position, maybe get up for a moment, do what you need to do to check and then choose to change as much as you need with your body. Keeping your body moving. Don't sit in front of a computer or sit doing things for more than about 45 to 50 minutes without moving. Next one is really juicy. E for emotion. And what you start off by doing is getting in touch with your current emotion or emotions, which very few people are consciously aware of. Mm -hmm. So it's bringing it up into your consciousness. And maybe you discover, oh, you know, I'm a little grumpy. I'm a little tired. I'm a little not feeling very happy. And so at that minute, what I use is, is a, an imagination thing. I have a long corridor. And on one side of the corridor, all the negative emotions. And on the other side of the corridor, all the positive emotions. So at that moment, if I find I'm in the grumpy room, I think, right, thank you, grumpy room. And I stand up inside my head, walk into the corridor, and I look at the plethora of gorgeous opportunities for positive emotions that are appropriate for what I'm doing. Do I need to be focused? Do I need to be playful? Do I need to be svelte? Do I need to be funny? What do I need to be? Which emotion? Do I need to be calm? Do I need to be content? And I go into that room, shut the door behind me, and put that on for what I'm doing. So again, it's check the emotion and change. And what often happens in real life is that we slip back but every single time we slip back, we can say, uh-uh, I'm in control. I choose to be in the peaceful room instead of in the grumpy room. A for actions. Actions are, all of these obviously tie together and pulling them apart is, is a little bit difficult sometimes. But actions, the key thing I say, are you using just the amount of energy you need for what you're doing? <laughs> so an example, somebody sending an email, when they're all happy and everything's good. 
somebody sending one when they're cross. Much too much energy unnecessarily. Think of a really top-notch runner. They look as if it's effortless. They just glide along. So just check what you were doing and think, was I using just enough energy, not wasting any? And T for thoughts. Oh, this is a really crafty one. Do you have a, a voice inside your head? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, um, I, actually, of, I, of course. Yes. I think, but I think again, you're how, it's so right. How conscious are we of it? Mm. It chitter chatters away nonstop, most of which research says is negatively pulling us down. We're questioning ourselves. We're saying we didn't do something correctly. We're saying we made a fool of ourselves. We're saying ah, 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 after, after, after. So again, we come in touch with that voice and we say, check, is that voice helping me? Mm -mm. So what do I choose? I choose to have a voice that says, way to go. You can do it one more time. You're looking good, good kid. Go for it. And we encourage ourselves the way we would a dear friend, the way we would a child. We do that for ourselves. So when you're used to this, literally in seconds, going to a nasty meeting, going to a doctor's appointments, meeting someone and you know you're going to have a difficult conversation and you're heart is beating and you've got butterflies flying around all over the place and your tummy is feeling uncomfortable you can go body let me take control maybe do a little breath emotion what's the emotion i need action look calm look cool and thoughts how can i support myself to the best Ooh, those two the breath and beat are just really little jam-packed gems no, I love the way you do. I think you've played a, a, a Jedi mind trick on me because I'm sure I said, have you got one? And you said, oh, I'd love to share two. And you sneak three in. It's just, yeah. <laughs> what can I say? But you just <laughs> reminded me of um, the fourth one there in particular, the thoughts and how we are very often our own worst critic, aren't we? You know, we'd never say some of the things that we say to ourselves too probably even our worst enemy <laughs> you know how rubbish was that how terrible of, of you know these are the thoughts that go on in our heads and as you say if you can just catch yourself in the moment then actually you can do uh, something st structured now and something positive to f swing that around so thanks for sharing that amazing i love that i mean i think the whole um I and mean, i've seen you do this with with groups of people and i've seen how they've responded to the whole eight steps so all i can say to the listeners if you want to find out about the other steps grab a copy of that book and we'll give out some other links as well uh, in the process so you can go and help yourself with this process but it's powerful it works and i think that's what's great about it you're, you're a, a woman after my own heart bander in as much as you like the pragmatic stuff the stuff that's going to really make a difference for people and Mind she certainly does that. May I add, while I'm popping things in, Go I did say there are four parts to the book, and I've told you about one and four. Can I do mm. that? Yes, just about. Um, two and three. Two is where we take mind chi and we apply it to a particular goal or problem. So mm. it's taking the same basic eight minutes, but we're addressing a particular goal or problem. That's really powerful. We use structural tension there. And the third part is 50 scenarios that we've worked out that cover everything you might need for business or personal living relationships, 50 ones that we've worked out with your beat that you may currently be experiencing, what you might desire, and a page worth of, we've tried to be very practical, new and different kinds of things that might help you actually build your skills. So that's the whole four parts. I didn't want people to be thinking, hmm, she only said two, but those are the other two pieces. Excellent. We're talking all about this amazing book, but it's not just a book. In a way, it's a way of life, but you only have to do it for eight minutes a day, which is just phenomenal. And the impact and the change that I've seen it uh, create for people in their lives is amazing you need to get this book um, but that's not why we're here we're not here to flog a book we're here to share with you some strategies and, and help you feel more resilient feel more able to get out there and support other people 
and sort your own life out in a way that makes you feel strong and ready for the day. So that's what we're here to do. So let me um, come back to you now, Vander, and ask you, um, as I say, every week, if I'm if I'm able to you know, get some time with someone who's a real change maker, I want to um, do all I can to help share your story in a way that inspires other people to go out there and make change happen. Or if it's not that, it's how do we cope with change in our own lives? And I know that you've had many stories and many um, adventures along the way, which have probably tested your stress and strain capability to the to the absolute max. But if you've maybe got one that you could share with us and maybe give us some insights as to how we can cope with change. Um, well, I had a really nice bottoming out. And I, I think that it's important for people to hear that all kinds of people can have that and that I ended up writing a, a you know, a mind chi resilience book that happened after I had bottomed out and a whole series of things happened where all of the cornerstones that I thought in my life were solid, solid going to be there was suddenly removed. And it, it was that I'd built the company for 22 years from uh, a rented little office and a, and a box of books to a, an office building, um, a staff that had been with me many years and about a hundred plus trainers all over the world. And uh, suddenly I was involved in an aggressive takeover and whoop, the whole thing, everything I had done for 22 years was removed. What was most upsetting were the relationships. These were my family of choice, the people that I'd worked with and seen develop and seen change and been through so much over 22 years. So whoop, off that went. Um, and which was quite a turmoil, as you can probably imagine. At the same time, my dear mama, who used to live with me part of the time that I'd been looking after, got rather sick and then died and was um, really the only remaining relative that I had. I, I didn't really have any others. So these things were all happening. And, and a couple of things that I want to say is one that when you are down, it is right to acknowledge that you're down and not to do, uh, well, I'm fine. Actually, everything is okay. No, it isn't. Sadness, anger, whatever it is you might be expressing are other forms of energy, which are rich and ripe in their own. Um, most of the most beautiful music was written from sadness or anger or, or some very negative and strong emotion. Yes. So be with that emotion, the trick the really important thing is to know that you don't need to stay there, that you can bounce back up. So if you think of like nice round tennis ball, it's all round and happy and all's fine. And then it comes down to the ground. And actually, when it hits the ground, it squidges. So be squidged for a while. Be in that and know that if you just breathe, you can begin to bounce and come back up the other side. So here I was totally squidged, dealing with change that was just going on in every single direction. And just to top it off at the final thing was two final things. My partner that I'd had for 24 years unceremoniously dumped me. And on top of that, I was having a birthday with a zero. Uh, <laughs> which always makes you kind of focus, who am I, what am I doing, et cetera, et cetera. As a part of my birthday, I saw a little flyaway ad that said, climb Mount Kilimanjaro um, and raise money for your local hospital. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll give that one a go. And, and so it is beginning, I, they, they have an expression, um, nature abhors a vacuum. And I'd rather like to change that and say, I think nature loves a vacuum because since everything had been removed that I thought was me and my life, it made space for new things to come in. So here I am running up Mount Kilimanjaro. It was the most incredible experience. And one of the people that was climbing it as well is now my husband. Ah. <laughs> and with my husband came a job lot 
with daughters and sons and family. So I suddenly had a whole family. Then came the opportunity to write Mind Chi, so I did that. So all of these outcomes came from that vacuum, from everything being removed. And it is truly now that in change, no matter how bad it may initially look, I truly believe that it can be changed for the better. That, for example, what I feel, I'm stronger, I'm wiser, I'm more resilient, I have new opportunities that I never would have had. And so consequently, just having that shift means that when you are down at the bottom of the squashed ball bounceability bit, faster and faster, you, you can come back up again. And that to me was such an important message in how to manage change and why resilience and change go hand in hand and, and why I'm so happy to be working now partnering with the Change Maker Group because they're Everybody is facing change more rampantly than ever before. And people are constantly, oh, you know, this is it's uncomfortable, it's new, I'm not, I don't know where I am, I'm not in control. And so knowing this information, building their resilience, being ready for whatever may come in the future, to me is so important. Yeah, I love that. And you mentioned the change maker group there, and you were saying earlier before we we came on on the air that you've put some programs together with the group that uh, focused in a slightly different way from the mind chi. What what is it that the, that you're doing there? Well, we have the change maker program and the change leader program, and in both of those, we have one section that is particularly for building resilience. Yeah. We have some wonderful profiles, and one of them is to do with a communication profile that enables us to see how to support and reach out, and you end up with four different colors. And so I took that and I called it Color Me Resilient. <laughs> and so what people do is they build eight bespoke resilient strategies based on their color, based on their dominant style, based on the way that they want to reach out to people. So that's one of them. And then we have another profile, which looks, and I love this because what it says is that everybody has an equal role in actually making change happen. There isn't anyone anywhere that doesn't have a major contributing part. And so what we've done again is to take that one that we're giving to the people in the change maker program and the change leader program. And we're saying, right, with those five different ways of giving your business energy, there are also five different ways that your energy might be sucked or might be boosted. And so we have another program called Resilience for Change, which is where we particularly look for each of those five proclivities and for people to understand for the people they're working with, why, what, why something might pull somebody down that doesn't pull somebody else down. We are all very different in our responses. And how can I be sensitive to that? And how can I maybe reach out to help that person? Or how can I have the courage to stand up and say, mm, excuse me, not doing so well, please come along. And humans are just so fantastic, they will. They will turn around and reach out and you'll have the nicest stories to tell as a part of all of that. Excellent. And um, so where can people find out a little bit more about those um, programs? There is a wonderful website, the three W's, thechangemakergroup.com. I'm sure you're going to give some connections for people to do. Um, and if they just go on there, if they go through the MindChi site, there is a 3wsmindchi.com. It links right into the Changemaker site. And so either way, you can then contact any of us very easily by email. We're delighted to speak with you. And we are really caring that you can get these things into your life. Share it with your team. Share it with your groups. We have a charity part also with the Changemaker group. So we also work with charities. So there is no excuse if you're in need not to be able to have us. Did I say that the right way around? Yes. I think that came out quite right. Yeah, well done. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, as I was listening to your story about, you know, when, when you were, as you said, sort of reaching rock bottom, but also that concept of the, 
of the tennis ball. As you say, if you watch a tennis ball in slow motion, it's squished down to virtually nothing, isn't it, when it lands um, with the force of, a, say, a serve, and then it does bounce back up. But I remember hearing Les Brown, the great motivational speaker, talk once, and he had a phrase which, which was, it was a way he thought about something, which was, when he was down on the floor, if I can look up, I can get up. And, and I, I was just imagining you on the ground, you know, looking up Mount Kilimanjaro, thinking, well, if I can see up there, I'm going. <laughs> and maybe metaphorically, that was a you know, big change for you there. It's, it's right, those little steps. It's, it's one more time, those little, little steps. So I may be like this, but if I can just begin, I had, do we have time for a little story? Go, go. Okay, I have a, had a very dear friend who had almost everything really, really wrong in her life. Everything you could think of was, was really disastrous. And she was from Hickory, Tennessee. And we were talking, 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 um, trying to help her through this time. And she said to me, you know, one day, she said, I realized that if 99% is really awful, 1% is still good. I look for that 1%, the perfect cup of tea, whatever, the sun shining, a bird landing somewhere. And suddenly that 1% feels a little bit like 4 or 5%. I'm now on 5%. 95 is awful. But you can see where I'm going with this. Slowly, slowly, by keeping your toe foothold in the little bit that's good, you can start to push. So right along with Les's story, just lifting up is starting to let you feel, yes, I can take back off again. Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I've got just one last thing to ask you, Vanna, which is, is there a song or a, or a track that you, that, that you conjure up in your mind, if you like, when you think about some of those stories, some of those times when, you know, maybe life has hit you hard, but you've found a way through it and, you know, your old whole resilience piece, if you like. But is there a track that springs to mind? Because I thought we could share that with the audience. Um, well, the one I, I, could, I could think of several, but one is Staying Alive. Oh, um, that one. <laughs> which is kind of important. Um, and I immediately have, you know, John Travolta doing all of this and leaping about all over the place and, and singing and it is what we're about, and it ties right back into the joy, because by staying alive, by having music, by having something that makes you smile, you get that joy. And with that, you get energy. And with energy, you can then face whatever change has been thrown at you. So I, I just thought that might be a little bit of a fun one to win over the others. Excellent. Well, we'll play that next. I just wanted to, I was just thinking how for a lot of people, music is that one percent story that you were telling us you know it is the go if you if you have a track that really resonates and does make you smile or picks you up just put it on you know in those moments because it will start the momentum of yeah. uh, of bringing joy back into your life so let's listen to the Bee Gees and staying alive we've had a fantastic conversation I don't know about you but I've really really enjoyed this and if I can get you back again maybe because I know that there's another um, aspect of mind chi which we haven't covered today which is all about the difference between stress and strain and mm -hmm. I think that is a really good insight that we can maybe pick up another time if you're willing to come back of course um, <laughs> so of all the things that we've covered then is there something you want people to go away with that you feel you'll feel like your work here today is done well, as usual, <clears throat> may I have two? Um, <laughs> so the first and most important one is that you always have a choice mm -hmm. as to how you respond. Whatever the change, whatever the situation, just realize you are in control of you. And it may feel difficult, but every second that you grab that control back just helps you again to push further and further, further into being able to make things work for you, for everyone, for the better. So mm -hmm. that's a really crucial thing. And the other thing is um, about joy. And it is to put joy into your mind and to think, just to look out as you go through the day 
of moments of contentment, moments of joy, just little things that might happen. Catch a stranger's eye maybe and, and find yourself smiling at each other. Teeny weeny little things wherever they might be and just kind of go, mm, a moment of joy. Yes, I've anchored that one. That was good. And you build those up one after the other. So those are my one <clears throat> things for people. <laughs> and of course, here on KLDR, you can find some joy almost every minute of the day. This is a station that's for you. It's a leadership development station. And the idea is to share with you ideas, insights and inspiration to make your life even better. So come back next week for The Change Show with me, Simon Phillips. I just want to say one last big, huge thank you to Vanda North. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. My pleasure, Simon. Thank you. And do be in touch and hope we can help people feel that control. Excellent.